So again, thank you for joining. SubhanAllah, you know, I thought a few minutes ago, I was ready to cancel this. Ya Allah, I'm sorry. And it wasn't for any other reason, but I uh, made the mistake of not um, broadcasting. So I was sitting with my co-host saying, oh, it looks like it's going to be just you and me. And then um, she's the one who uh, made me realize I needed to broadcast the webinar. Hello. And then we could get people joining. So Anyhow, that shows you how little, uh, how much I know about this Zoom, even though I've been doing it pretty much every day of my life in the past two months, I'm still not uh, very well at it. But anyway, Jazakallah Khairan for being here. Um, the talk that I wanted to uh, present today, actually, I just, um, I've been thinking a lot about many things lately, especially in the, as we entered this last 10 days of Ramadan, we all um, know that it's a little bit more serious. You know, I don't know how many of you were on last night's Rahma Foundation, uh, Qiyam, but I, I, I spoke about uh, just, you know, the theme that we're all entering uh, these last 10 nights with, and it's, it's heavier. And uh, I was just remarking, uh, or in my comments last night, saying that I was thinking about the wisdom behind why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala organized the month in the way that he did. You know, the first 10 is mercy, and then we have the middle of forgiveness. And then the last 10, we have suddenly this very intense theme. It's like, whoa, you know, if you look at the trajectory, it makes sense if you're um, thinking and reflecting about, you know, the wisdom of the, the human being. We're very forgetful, right? We're very forgetful, but we're also, um, we're weak. We're created weak. So, you know, in his mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we enter this beautiful month, he receives us with mercy. And he, you know, because we have to get used to the drastic change, the sort of shock to our physical bodies. Uh, and in, even spiritually, a lot of people have to hold themselves back from so many things that they've, you know, negative things and behaviors that they've acquired over the years. And they do, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless them and reward them and increase them because they make a concerted effort, maybe more so in Ramadan than any other time, where they're trying to refrain from maybe using foul language or doing other things that are just, you know, really bad or haram. Um, so there, there, it's an effort that is, uh, is difficult for some people. So there's the mujahida, right, that's happening for all of us. And then the physical, you know, the hunger, uh, the sleep deprivation, the thirst, the coffee withdrawals. I mean, I certainly feel the coffee withdrawals even now, um, uh, you know, stumbling over words. It's just, it's like we're not very lucid, you know, because of all of those things. So there's that weakness that um, when we enter the month, we naturally have, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for us by helping us to just ease into it with mercy and messages of mercy. And so you see all of uh, the talks around that time of the month. I, I watch several, every, all the um, you know, khatibs or the sheikhs or the imams or the speakers were talking about the mercy of Allah because this is the theme, right? And then subhanAllah, we go into that forgiveness phase and it's a little bit more serious now because now we're, we're you know, we've, by 10 days, we should now be in some bit of a rhythm and things are uh, getting easier by just facilitation and uh, from Allah. So it's, we're getting a little bit more, you know, used to things, but uh, I, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately puts this um, theme of forgiveness on us is to, in my estimation or my, or what I, my reflections anyhow, are again to just humble us because we're so forgetful. So if we if we ride that wave of ease and mercy too much, it's very natural that we'll just kind of maybe start taking things lightly um, in terms of our prayers, maybe not reading the book of Allah as much, or we start to get a little lax in terms of the time usage, right? Where we're gonna um, maybe watch a little bit of TV here instead of, especially in this quarantine where we're not able to move about freely and maybe do other things that we normally would do. Um, so I think the nafs would, would, you know, inclines to kind of just take it, looking for those little loopholes and, and moments where you can, you know, be, be your nafs again. But subhanAllah that Allah kind of stops us in our tracks in a way and says, wait a second, you've had the mercy. Now you need to, you know, think about all the stuff you've done that, um, that you need to ask for forgiveness for. So we get into a very humbled state, right? We're returned. As soon as we get a little bit of confidence or maybe some wind, we're returned back. We're, we're told to nope, keep your head low because now you need to kind of sit with some shame. And, you know, and shame is a powerful, uh, it's a word that evokes a lot of emotion depending on how you use it. If it's between people, obviously that never goes right because human beings shouldn't shame one another, but oftentimes we do. And it's, 
it's a, a it's weaponized to really destroy people's souls and spirits and and lives and you see a lot of people all the um they've uh, they've uh, you know I mean, people have killed themselves because of of an onslaught of shame you know, living in, in a household with a toxic person that just constantly reminds you of all of your negativity and all your problems can d definitely throw someone into a state of absolute despair that eventually puts them, what's the meaning of life, you know, and then they just, oh, that's their inevitability. So shame is very powerful in a lot of, and human beings, we, we use it um, in, in the worst ways with each other. And that's not part of our tradition. We don't shame people. Um, but but when you have self shame before Allah subhanahu wa taala, that's a much health, healthier version of shame, because we make so many mistakes. We're constantly careless and we're heedless, and it's important to recognize and own that. You know, um, part of the maturation process, the natural maturation process of a human being is that we have a lot of, you know, uh, leeway in the early years, right? Childhood, you allow for a lot of mistakes. There's no accountability because you don't, you know, you're not able to discern right from wrong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, again, in his mercy, he is uh, lifting the pens, as they say, and, and there's no accountability for the child. But once the child matures and they have the ability to know right from wrong, and then they enter that next phase of life of adolescence, um, then yes, you're now held accountable and we can't um, extend the childhood mindset, which is unfortunately what you're seeing in the world around us. You know, they want to extend childhood, the mindset of childhood, where everybody's kind of, nobody holds themselves to account anymore. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, I did it. And they just move on the way a child would, you know, a toddler, if you've ever been around a toddler, they could break something, they could drop something, but they don't have the ability or the maturity to realize the consequences of their actions. And so they just carry on. They're not really affected, right? And that's what we see in our world today, where a lot of people, they are making egregious, uh, I mean, horrific, their behavior is just so all the Bila sinful and hedonistic and just all the things that are, again, not part of our tradition, but they will make excuses for themselves all the time. And it's not even a big deal. They don't even have remorse. This is what we call ghafla, right? It's a disease of the heart. When you are so far gone in, in and I'm not just talking about non-Muslims, right? I'm talking about our own community, people maybe in our own family who are very well aware of the haram and the halal, who know who, that Allah is real and inshallah they have Iman, but they've adopted this say la vie, carefree attitude that says, you know what, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do and I, I'm not really worried about the consequences. And that's again, part of the um, collective sort of, as we call it, the, the, the zeitgeist of our time. And zeitgeist is like the, the spirit of the time. And the spirit of the time that we're living in is godlessness. It's ghafla, it's heedlessness. It's just not really caring and living 100% for your own shahwa, your own desires and whims. And that's how we live. And so you see a lot of that in our world today. Uh, so, you know, it's important to, again, uh, center back and say, well, how can we uh, control this? Because we don't, uh, you know, want to be obviously afflicted by these things. And how can we prevent this from happening in our own way, right? Uh, well, that's why this month of Ramadan is such a blessing because Allah Subhanahu recognizes that we're so forgetful. If we don't have something to uh, reorient us to our purpose, then we'll lose ourselves. So again, he, he reminds us to you know, think back on all the things you've done, take account for everything and ask me for my forgiveness. And then it's not even guaranteed, right? It's just, we're supposed to just actively be asking. And then subhanAllah, when that phase is done, the last 10 days is, is also human nature. So I don't know how many of you people are seeing it, but I'm already seeing a lot of Eid sort of talk, you know, we're not even fully yet done with the month yet, but Eid starts popping up because we are eager to move beyond the discomfort of fasting and we're eager to kind of just get back to our normal routines. And yes, you know, people recognize the, the immense barakah of the month, but there is that other nafsi pull, you know, like, oh, I can go out again. I can have my coffee in the morning. I can eat breakfast. These are all thoughts that people have, right? So the, the mind starts to drift away again and we start to look at, at that finish line and that's what 
you know, every, everybody's like, yeah, yeah, but subhanAllah, look at what Allah does. It's so, the wisdom is incredible. No, we're not even going to think about anything in this world. Like forget, you know, and I mean, like the lens is just shifted completely to something that is so uh, beyond maybe our imagination, but also real that we're forced to look at it, which is you need to not move just from forgiveness, but now ask me for protection from the hellfire. So it's like this gradual intensity that's happening. And you would think the opposite, right? I mean, naturally you would think the more you do something that it would get easier as you do it, the longer you do it. But subhanAllah, it's actually getting more intense and there's incredible wisdom in that. And the wisdom in my, again, this is my thoughts, is that you know we know because it happens every year back to our forgetful nature, we fall into a false sense of security that because we've done, amassed all of this, you know, uh, these blessings and these rewards, inshallah, we're, we're, we have hope in our Lord that he's rewarding us and that we've done a lot, right? We look at, we're doing our prayers on time, we're fasting, we're reading Quran, we're giving more charity. So the mind or the nafs, I should say, deludes us to think that, well, you've done so much now, give yourself a pat on the back, and now um, you can coast it for the next year, right? And so this is what subconsciously happens to many people, which is why we see that dip of um, you know, spirituality and practice immediately after the month, because it's the nature of human beings. We vacillate constantly in these two you know, sort of places. So uh, the fact that Allah, again, is letting our last moments or telling us that our last moments in this month are so intense that we are to be focusing on uh, asking actively for protection from the hellfire. I think we really have to, you know, take that seriously as uh, a way to, again, keep us centered and focused and humbled in the month as we're, you know, continuing to let it, uh, you know, experiencing it as it as every day comes. But even beyond that, so that we have those memories with us when we leave this month that, you know, I, because I don't know how many of us, again, I was speaking to someone yesterday, a friend, um, and I was telling her when I, a long time ago, when I first came to the Dean or practiced the Dean, I threw myself into certain topics, like a lot. I loved to look at anything related to stories of the jinn or angels, all the supernatural stuff, really. Um, but I also did a lot of reading into the signs of the end of time, a lot of, uh, you know, reading into death and the process of death, like all the, the soul, the travels of the soul, the barzakh. I read everything I could find on what happens when the soul is extracted and the questioning and just the scene unfolding in front of, you know, uh, to, uh, the, the believer or the non-believer because there's different, you know, experiences. And then the afterlife. And so I did so much of that. But in my, I'll be honest with you, it's been a while since I visited a lot of that, those themes, because I think just generally speaking, our community has maybe picked up um, some of the uh, political correctedness that we see around us, where we're very, um, we're, we're always talking on a, uh, you know, and it's, it makes sense. I mean, alhamdulillah, it's part of our tradition. You know, when we do dawah or we teach, we invite with rahmah, we invite with ease, we invite with gentleness. That's definitely part of our deen. But I think if it monopolizes, if that message is monopolizing, then we may inadvertently be causing um, some imbalance there because the Prophet ﷺ was Bashirun wa Nadir. He came with good news, but he also warned. The Quran has good news, but it also has warnings in it. So the one sided messaging that we've kind of adopted, where it's all good and we don't really even talk about, I mean, when's the last time you've heard any scholar talk about the signs of the end of time? I, I honestly can't remember. Um, Sheikh Hamza, I know a few years ago sort of did stuff, but I don't really know of many other scholars who are talking about the signs of the end of time, the jal, you know, when that um, Messiah show came out on Netflix, caused a little bit of a buzz and I was hopeful that maybe we'd see more content. But I, when I was, it was in the 90s, I don't know how many of you remember, it was, that was it. That was like all we were hearing. We were hearing about the um, Masonic temples, right? How many of you remember those uh, talks, khutbas, right? On the conspiracy theories and all of the, you know, secret societies and then the Dajjal and there was so much, you know, theme. And I'm not saying that we should return necessarily to having just that, but I feel like the balance is kind of lost where 
we don't talk about these very serious realities. And then the further and further that, or the, the, you know, the fact that we don't talk about it, the further and further it goes away from us so that it's not really real. You know what I mean? It's not really real to us, but this is part of our aqidah. It, you, you know, it's the six articles of faith. You have to believe in heaven and hell that it is a reality, and it is it's 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 a it's something that is in existence, right? And so, even though we don't uh, see, we're not aware of it or we can't see it because it's part of the unseen realm, it is in existence. And so, to for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to have us concentrate a, a third of this mubarak month on thinking about something that is painful to think about you know a lot of people for example you know death itself um you know one of the diseases of the heart is antipathy to death where you are repulsed there's a revulsion to death it's actually a disease of the heart because death uh, by in our tradition is not something where we revolted by we actually are probably the most healthiest uh in terms of our attitude about death and and really the reason why is again out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gave us such a a great amount of detail about it you look to other traditions they don't have anywhere near the level of detail that we have about the process of death you know the barzakh um and what happens the unfold like the events that unfold on the day of judgment there's so much in uh, our uh you know in our uh, sacred texts that describe these things, whereas other traditions have very little to no content. And I've heard from converts who've converted to Islam that that was also one of the reasons that contributed to their Iman is that they saw that there were there was just so much information and it gave them some peace of mind. Because I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know, if you don't have a belief in the afterlife, Ya Allah, I don't know how people really, it's kind of shocking to me how people are in existence walking around and they don't believe, they believe that this world is like, there's a finality to it and that's it. And then you're just dust and worm food. And I, I think that takes a great degree of, um, I don't know if they're just, I mean, it's, it's clearly delusion, but I, maybe that creates this, you know, sort of ability to uh, be, um, impervious to all the stuff going on around you and or even just uh, the the fact that you're not going to see your loved ones at a later time you know what if you have a tragic loss like i i don't know how they're processing that i really don't know how they're doing it reconciling the the belief that there's no nothing beyond this world with their pain because we are humans allah created us with emotions so grief is very real and it's just it's mind boggling but alhamdulillah our we have a belief that this the story there's more to the story and just because you know this world is it is temporal and you know things are event you know there it's unpredictable we don't know who's going to go when and how things are going to happen that there's a much bigger and greater story this is like you know the uh, the forward of like a long beautiful novel that's going to uh, ha unfold afterwards and not to get wrapped up in the forward because there's so much more to come but that gives us solace. It gives me peace when I think of the people that I've lost in my life, right? Uh, Alhamdulillah, I believe firmly with Yaqeen, inshallah, that I'm going to see my father again. And that's why when I was, when he was slipping, you know, and, and he passed in front of all of his children and his uh, nieces and nephews and his in-laws, when he was passing away, I had peace in my heart. And that was from Allah, because I knew that his body is just a shell. But the eternal part that lasts forever is that soul. So alhamdulillah, you know, that we have a deen that is complete. And I think, again, there's just so much great wisdom in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to concentrate our um, mind and heart on protection from the fire in these last 10 days. Because we need all of that intensity to, to make sure we don't stray for the next you know, 11 months until we're back at this month, because that's really what it is. Uh, Ramadan is like, you know, when you, it's the uh, the tether that that keeps our hearts connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also the filtration, you know, month of filtration where we get to come back and filter and detox. And then we go right back out into the, the messy dunya until we swing back uh, the next year, if we're lucky, right? But that process it requires uh, or for it to really be effective so that we don't go too far, I think makes the most sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I said, is giving us this deep, um, you know, this very intense, I should say, theme that we're supposed to think about every day. So in these last 10 days, you know, uh, this is what we're told to do. We have to confront these realities. 
and confront our uh, sinfulness and, um, and that we have no guarantees. Um, now with that said, because I want to stick to what we talked about and or what I, you know, the theme, we also don't want to fall into despair because yes, Jahannam is real, so is Jannah. And um, when we talk about, you know, thing, asking for protection of the fire, it's not to fall into a state of despair and belief that you're doomed and you have no hope because that's, you know, shaitan wants that. So th there's a fine line of being very humble to know that, you know, you need to continuously and actively seek Allah's forgiveness and repentance because nobody has safe, nobody's safe, right? Until he decrees, nobody's safe, but have immense hope um, and, you know, keep yourself motivated every day. So how do we find that balance and not let those negative thoughts, worries, anxieties, concerns um, overwhelm us? Because I know a lot of people have reached out to me, especially in this pandemic, just stressed by all of it. It's very stressful. It's, um, and there's, it's anxiety inducing. If you're not, if you don't know what's going to come tomorrow, um, you know, let alone the year ahead, right? Because sometimes if something is temporary, we can, we can manage our emotions, right? But if there's no end in sight, then the anxiety increases tenfold, a hundredfold. So that's why you see a lot of people really crippled by anxiety because there's no answers like please someone tell me that this is going to be end over by you know this month or this and then I'll, I'll cope but when we don't have any answers it can induce that and so there's that anxiety of that and then you know obviously just in general whatever uh, state that you find yourself in again when you're doing this inner sort of work you might start feeling um, just not good about yourself and you have to be careful that you don't fall into the traps of shaitan so what i wanted to do today is just kind of talk a little bit about well specifically about women because women we have it's just it's yeah the black because i you know i see it when i think of uh, things i see see kind of like the matrix right in my mind certain things i see in the matrix so when I read a research that says women are twice as likely to suffer from depression, and these are global statistics, right? That, um, you know, uh, that, so, so it's, uh, you know, not just depression, but like self, uh, you know, image problems, self, um, what is the word? Uh, self-esteem, thank you, I could not think of the word. Self-esteem issues, self-image issues, also suicidal ideation. You're seeing the statistics kind of, you know, center around women more than men and to me that's just tragic because there's so much potential and so much power in in what women do we're just Allah has enriched us and given us so much so it's it's tragic to me because what's happening is it's iblis it's all iblis he's he has very effectively and this is you know i gave a talk a short while ago but i came up with this analogy so that we can understand what i think is happening you know um our, our psyche is connected to our you know, spiritual center, right? And this is the most coveted thing that Iblis wants. He wants to destroy us from within. So his mission is very clear. He's going to work tirelessly. And he doesn't sleep, by the way. The shayateen don't sleep. They have no rest, okay? So we're talking a 24-hour relentless campaign of how can I destroy as many people as possible, right? And uh, it's amazing because, you know, um, the connectivity that we all have with the internet and all the stuff that modern technology has afforded us are also really powerful tools for him to do this work even more so, right? Because he has direct access to us in a way that we're not, um, that previous generations didn't really have, you know, the, it was a much harder job for him to do what he had to do previously, but now it's like he's, we're literally inviting him into our lives, into our homes every single day by, by the, these means, right? And so um, I'm going to use this analogy because it works. You want to look at it like, um, a, you know, your psyche or your spiritual center, kind of the same way, like a, again, a computer system that has been hacked into, okay? Um, shaitan is the ultimate, the you know, the, the hacker that nobody ever wants to know, right? The one who can do it all. He's got tricks up his sleeves and nobody can really trace him. He's like untraceable, right? There, there's hackers that are like that on the dark web. They're very hard to, you know, they're, they're elusive. They're, they can't, the FBI and all these, uh, you know, uh, agencies cannot track them down because they know they're ahead of the game, right? That's Iblis. So he knows how to hack into each of us individually, 
and um, him and his minions. And the way that they do it, you know, some of the attacks are very clear. So when you're talking to some people, their, their spiritual attacks, you can tell right away. This is a total waswasa. You have to reject those thoughts. But other uh, ways that he gets in are what we call, you know, there's, for again, I'm using computer terminology, but like, um, you know, malware, right? There's malware, there's spyware, there's all these different wares, right? But um, one of the things that is very powerful is what they call the Trojan horse, right? Which uh, is sneaky. It comes in undetected. You don't know that it's even there. And then it destroys everything. It wreaks havoc. So this is how he has, I think, effectively gone, gotten through to a lot of us specifically women, and I'll explain why I think that, but he's basically dispatched um, his minions to attack us and to embed himself into that spiritual center where slowly, it's like a slow release poison, you know, that he is releasing to destroy our entire beings. And I see so many sisters, and a lot, a lot of it breaks my heart because they will talk about how they're having you know, a psychosomatic response to whatever they're feeling. They're feeling bad about themselves. Maybe they're single and they're not married yet. So now Shaitan has found a way to cripple their self-esteem. You have nothing to offer. You're unlovable. You've got this problem. So that happens to a lot of our single sisters. Um, then you have married sisters who are in relationships and they are just full of self-doubt. You know, um, is he going to leave me? Or is he going to take another wife? I'm not pretty enough. I have to lose weight. I can't eat around him because he'll think this. And you see this total, again, crippling of, 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 of sisters that's happening. They just don't have any self-value, anything that they're holding on to because they're consumed by these thoughts. And then you have mothers who enter motherhood who just on every decision, beat themselves up, question themselves constantly. What's wrong with me? My kids are going to turn out this way. I'm, I suck. Look at all these other, you know, and I'm sorry for the frank language, but you know, that's the kind of language and the thoughts that they get. I'm a terrible mother. Um, you know, look at so-and-so, she seems to have it all. And there's all this compare and contrast. And so you start to just chip away at every single, you know, phase of a woman's life. He's found a way to, again, send those viruses in and destroy us from within, chip away at our self-confidence, at our value. And then we're just deduced to this kind of, um, you know, free uh, sort of uh, unleashing uh, of these, you know, I, I, again, I'm visualizing, I'm visually, uh, visualizing a lot when I talk, but like, I just look at it like, you know, when you have, um, what's the word, there's a term, I apologize. This is, this is the effect of a lack of coffee. But when things are just, you know, um, streaming, you know, uh, thoughts that are uncontrollable and they're just coming from every angle and she's not aware that these are all what? These are all waswasa. Those negative thoughts that make you feel so terrible about every part of yourself, they're not, they don't originate from you. They originate from him. And it's all part of the design, you know, that what he's, he knows, he's been watching us, right? He knows how to do this. And so if you're not aware of his uh, tools and his, you know, modus operandi, how he operates, you're susceptible to his attacks. So it's very important to, to be able to pay attention to your thoughts. And just on the topic of thoughts, you know, according to the research, we have anywhere from 50,000 to 80,000 thoughts a day. I mean, that's a, a huge amount of thoughts. If you're, if you're like, follow from the start of your day until you go to sleep, is it any wonder why we have anxiety? Really? I mean, is it any wonder why we're all kind of panicking and not feeling any peace because we don't have quietude of the mind. It's like this bombardment of thoughts, right? And so first and foremost, that's important, right? That to know the number, but then to know the quality, right? Because that, that translates to 2,100 to between 2,100 to 3,500 thoughts an hour. Okay. So 80, 50 to 80,000, again, everybody's different, but in that range, then you're looking at the quality of the thoughts. 80% of the thoughts that we have, 80%, are actually repetitive, uh, they're, um, excuse me, negative, they're negative. And then 95% uh, are the same. So we have 80% negative thoughts, 95% repetitive thoughts. So that's a huge portion of your thoughts are exactly the way that we should depict Shaitan. He is the whisperer. And when you think of whispers, it's like one after the other, after the other, after the other. So it's just this 
you know, boom, 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 like this onslaught of the same repeated thought, right? So he knows what he's doing. And it's, uh, and, and that's what we're all walking around with, with that reality. So it's like, how do you free yourself from that so that you can build yourself up again and become an actual, your actual, you know, actualized self, your, the best potential and best version of yourself. How can you do that when your mind is again, been hacked into this way your spiritual center has been hacked into you cannot do that unless you know again how he works so alhamdulillah we have um and i'm going to read quickly uh, because if there's questions i'll take them inshallah and i don't want to keep you guys too long but i'll read from some of what our scholars have left us to give us some clarity first and foremost you need to be able to identify the types of thoughts you have because all thoughts they're first of all sourced from four different sources which we'll get to in a moment but they're also, you know, there's different types of thoughts. So we have uh, descriptions uh, that I'll read. The first is al-hajj, and this is a fleeting thought. It's something that enters the mind and then leaves quickly. So it's not really something that you're holding on to for very long, but it may be just a, you know, pop-up, you know, kind of like think of, again, another computer term, a pop-up that comes in your mind and then boom, it's gone. So that's al hajjis Then you have al khatir and al khatir is a thought that enters the mind, and you and we actually hold on to it a little bit longer. So you might think about it, you know, uh, for a few minutes, maybe thirty minutes, maybe an hour, but it's something that sits with you and you're dwelling on. Okay, and that specific one we'll we'll expand on in a minute. Um, hadith al nafs is now you're taking that thought and it's going to develop into an internal conversation. And so you're going to deliberate much more over this thought, um, maybe over a longer period of time or revisit it over a span of a couple of days. But it's just something that, again, could be anything. It could be a memory. It could be a plan, an idea. So we're, again, giving you just the breakdown of the different types or degrees of thoughts. Then you have alham. So once you've processed or deliberated, then there might be an impulse to act or like some motivational, you know, um, it, it inspires you to to be in a state, right? Um, I'm sorry, did I read that wrong? No, no, it's correct. So yeah, you 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 have this motivation, right? And then that motivation turns into what we call azam, which is now you are resolved to do uh, to execute the action. So whatever motivation you had to act, the azam is now you're going to develop that into an actual you know plan of action. So those are the different types of thoughts we have, right? Fleeting, sort of temporary, but, you know, you, you recognize them. That's like khatar. And then that, um, ha that conversation, internal dialogue that you have, which may span uh, over some time. Then there's an impulse to act. And then there's the, an actual plan of, of action. So those are the five different types of thoughts that come to us. Now, the sources are also important to know because the khatar or khawatir are or four, that every inspiration that you have is sourced from four sources. The first is Khawatir Rabbani or Rahmani, then Malikani, Nafsi, and Shaitani. And so inspired thoughts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are sort of commands to do good. They can come from, you know, responses from uh, doing the Salat al-Istikhara. So there's very clearly some, you know, the connection that, because that you're directly asking Allah, right? For, uh, for answers, right? That's what, why Ishara is so powerful. So that would be um, an inspiration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you. Marikani is more suggestive good works, right? Whenever you have a sort of a suggestive thought that you should do this, maybe you should do this, and it's good. It's a good work. It's a good effort. Um, there's blessing in it. That would be an inspiration by, from the angels, right? Marikani are the angels. So they, because we have angels that are around us and they inspire us to do good work, but it's kind of like a nudge. Then you have the uh, nafsani, which are your own thoughts. And this is accumulated over years and all of your experiences and memories and all the things that you know, you've been conditioned to think and your beliefs and your personal sort of ideologies, all of that can inform your nafsi thoughts, right? And then the last is shaitani. And this is where, this is the one we have to pay the most attention to because it is the most intrusive and the most corrosive of all the thoughts. It's the thoughts that really destroy our spiritual momentum, our spiritual uh, belief in ourself, our, our, all, all those things that we talked about, our you know, self-confidence. He chips away at that through uh, his waswasa. And so um, important to know how to differentiate also between the nafsi and the shaitani, because a lot of people, they falsely attribute their nafs uh, inspirations or actions to shaitan's waswasa. 
if you're doing the same things for years on end, you do not, cannot scapegoat Iblis and say, oh, Iblis inspired me to do this sin. You've habituated yourself to it. You, you're doing it. So that is your nafs has, is weak and your nafs needs to be conditioned to come out of that weakness. But you cannot scapegoat and say, oh, it was Iblis and he made me do it. It doesn't work that way. So that's very important to know. Iblis is original because he, you know, he, he wants to incrementally destroy us, right? So once he gets us into those bad habits, the next phase is how can we push her or him to the worse or thing. So his inspirations are always worse, a degree above, and they're new, they're novel. Um, and so that's how you differentiate. If you uh, fall into a sin you've never done before, or your sin has gotten worse. You, uh, I mean, you're, maybe you're doing uh, a deed, a bad deed, but it's incrementally getting worse. And I'll just use an example because it's the first thing that comes to mind. You know, if you're single, let's say, and you're talking to a brother, right? When you're talking to a brother and you are um, having conversations privately, right? That's not, we know that this is not permissible because it opens the door for shaitan. We do, a lot of people do this, right? We do it. We, we think it's not a big deal, but then we feel the effects of it later. Some people, you know, unfortunately take it to the next level as well. So it's not just that you're talking to them on privately, whether it's on the phone or text message or what have you, there's this intimate sort of setting, but then Iblis will come to you and say, you know what, what's the big deal? Like you guys have talked now for two or three weeks. Um, you know, maybe it's time to take it to the next level. Just talk on the phone. And so, you know, the, at least on a phone or a text thread or whatever, there's some distance, right? It's some, it's somewhat safe, safer than actually having a more real interaction, um, which is, you know, over the phone, or now we can do FaceTime and video messaging. Um, and so you see all of this behavior, you know, it's everywhere now. How many um, teens and young adults, youth, not even, you know, young adults, youth, we're talking adolescents, pre-adolescents have been caught or wrapped up in this horrific uh, reality of our world right now where young children are sexualized so early that they are sexting and they're sending lewd pictures of themselves to people. This is all because, again, shaitan has normalized it and it's no big deal, but a lot of people fall into this behavior. But how does he do it? He starts khutuwat shaitan or their footsteps. So it's like, let's start with a small thing first and then get them habituated to it and then we'll keep making them get worse. So that's how you know if it's Iblis or not. But if you're already doing it, it's you, right? So important to know that. So then, um, all of this, again, I know it's a lot of content, but just for us to reflect on how or what is his, what is the objective of Iblis? Well, as I said, he wants to destroy us spiritually, but also I, I like to visualize and I think it's effective, is you want to think of Iblis, his name comes from Ablas right, which is to despair. When a person is in despair, they're in a low state, right? They're low they're low. And so shaitan's ultimate goal is to bring us all down with him. He would want nothing more than to just make us all feel low about ourselves. So that's where those thoughts of despair and self-confidence come from is because that's his station. He's in the, he's in that realm of despair over, over his state. And so he wants to drag all of us down with him. So for women, a lot of times, this is the feeling that we get when we're stuck in these negative thought patterns is it's like a sinking feeling. It's like a feeling of, and I liken it to like, you know, quicksand where you're trapped in this just sinking uh, feeling and there's, you don't know how to get out. You want to, right? A lot of sisters, that nobody wants to feel that, right? But it's just, you're, you can't move. You're immobilized because the quicksand is sinking you further down. This is the danger of letting these thoughts take root and not uh, rooting them out, filtering them out, is that that's what happens is that, you know, and this is why depression, it's something that, you know, it kind of just buries people into this, you know, state of just, you know, again, come, almost like disappearing in front of you. They, uh, you know, one of the sign, telltale signs of depression is completely being, you know, reclusive and, and uh, not wanting any engagement with anybody and just sleeping a lot. So it's like you're hot, you almost just go inward and inward to such a degree that you're not seen anymore. Well, that's what he would want. It's like a, you know, way of 
making you disappear basically, which is another way of, you know, destroying you. So he wants that, but a lot of sisters, I mean, nobody wants to be in that state, but they don't know how to come out. Right. And so we, this is why it's so important to study his trappings and to study how he gets into our mind. And one of the very clear ways, again, this is my estimation in all the years that I've worked with women, is to chip away at our self-value and our self-confidence and make us constantly feel as, you know, the imposter syndrome. These are all syndromes where it's like you don't have, you know, um, you're always thinking you're, you're a fake, that you're, you know, not really good enough and that you don't deserve uh, whatever compliment or praise you get. You're just never, you're always overwhelmed by inadequacy. And I see this just the other day, actually, a sister um, messaged me about this very same topic. But, um, you know, that women are always held to impossible standards. We're compared to everybody else uh, and, you know, made to feel inadequate because the, those, you know, comparisons are, it's like from every source, you know, you can get it from your mom, your sisters, your friends may say something in passing, coworkers might say something, but there's a lot of compare and contrast with women and women beha women's behavior. And especially in social media now, you see it all over the place, right? Where um, women are pitted against each other, even if it's not direct, there is that element, you know, of of uh you know posting um something and you know whether it's 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 inviting hasad right it's inviting uh whoever the onlookers are to feel not good about themselves and that's why i have a big problem with a lot of the social media stuff that we see is that it's superficial it's fake it's we're, and i'm not talking about just filtered uh, stuff because a lot of stuff is filtered that's a fact but I'm even, I'm talking about presentation is so inauthentic, you know, it's inauthentic. You have a lot of influencers and they, you know, it's amazing because I don't know if it's Ramadan, but, you know, there's a couple of influencers who this month have kind of come out with some really devastating news about their own personal lives and what they're dealing with. But they're, they say, and one of them specifically said, I never want to pr present anything negative on my social media. So I've been holding on to this for years, but this is my reality. And it's like, wow, if that's not, you know, I mean, that I think is just, uh, you know, really uh, what, what's what we're seeing on a large uh, level. Everybody's doing that, whether even, whether or not they're, whether they're influencer or not, everybody is only presenting what they want you to the story they want you to believe. And so it's hard when you're, you know, sitting at home all day and you have young children, let's say you're a stay at home mom and you are, you know, between goo goo gaga and diapers and bottles and, you know, just mommy, why, uh, you know, an endless cycle of questions about everything in existence. You take a break to just go check out and have some level of adult interaction and you turn to Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook and all of a sudden you're looking at these picture perfect Pinterest lives of people um, that look like you, they talk like you, maybe they're from the same background as you, but their lives look so much like more polished and clean and there's no stains and their face is poreless and oh my gosh, I am the biggest loser ever. Look at me. I can't even handle, um, you know, my, my two children or three children and I'm, my hair is like gray and I have this problem, that problem. And it's like, we just sit there and, but where are those thoughts coming from? Right? Who's the one who's going to come when you're looking at that and tell you, you're such a loser. Oh my God, look at her. She has the perfect life. You're so pathetic. That is not coming from you. That's coming from you, Blis. That's a fact. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's amazing how, um, think about, for example, endorsements, you know, we as human beings by nature, we're not quick to give away our endorsements to just anybody, right? Like you don't endorse people that you don't really know. You don't go write a review about something that you haven't experienced, you know, or at least you don't know the person. Sometimes people do it for friends and family, but you know what I mean? We're very uh, selective about where we give our endorsements because it's an extension of us right it's like you don't want to compromise your reputation by endorsing a human being or something or that doesn't you know pan out for you because why your credibility goes down the drain when you do that nobody will believe you nobody will hold your word you know as, as, with any weight 
if you don't have credibility. And so we are very selective about what we do when it comes to that. But ironically, we don't vet um, the credibility of the source of the thoughts that we entertain. The credibility of Iblis's waswasa is, he has no credibility. He is the ultimate loser. He has nothing going for him, you know, and yet we give him credibility. It's ajib. It's so ajib that we actually empower someone who is the most disempowered of all of God's creation. He is nothing. And that's his fate. But we empower him by letting that thought that he injects in our psyche take root and then you know, as those, uh, the great, you know, the, the list that I said, you, you, it goes from a fleeting thought, which all of his waswasa should be fleeting, like, boom, get out of here. You're, it's worthless. It's pointless, right? We don't do that. We pick it up. We hold it. We stare at it. We look at it. Then we consider it. We unpack it and we consider it and we think about it. Oh, maybe I, maybe because I didn't, you know, do this when I was younger, this is why I'm in this state now. God such a loser. Why didn't I do that? Maybe if I was smarter, like so-and-so, I would have a better life. So now you see the layers? He just adds on the layers. And what's happening to you? Whatever momentum you had in that day, in that hour, in that moment has disappeared. Your feet are in that quicksand because that's where he wants you. You're not going to pick up and carry about your day when he's just basically destroyed you and told you that you're the ultimate loser ever and connected it with something that happened five, 10 years ago. This is insane. That's why it's so important to know anytime you have, you question the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's waswasa. Whatever happened in the past happened, khalas. you have to move away from it. The past is done. And you don't, we don't low, oh, I wish, I wish and lament over the past. Because it's the decree of Allah that you're, you're lamenting. And it's a disease of the heart to do that. You cannot go back and wish that things didn't happen the way they happened. Even if it's painful, even if it was a difficult experience for you personally, you can't do that because you're going against the decree of Allah. So when it comes to things in the past, if you have a thought about that event and then link it to where you are now, this is a 100% a spiritual attack because he's trying to destroy your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan and getting you lost in, again, this soup, this toxic soup of, of uh, despair that he wants you to just sink in. So you have to see it before it comes. And as soon as it's a thought about past events, you have to chuck it out and go, nope, Allah, Allah decreed it and I, you're accepting of it. That's it. And then, so the past, you stay in the past, right? So that's some sisters or brothers, you know, that's where they're at. Their past is crippling them from moving forward. It's like the ball and chain that they cannot separate from in order to do anything good and, and lead a positive life. They have no hope. They have no self-value. They just are sinking and sitting in that, marinating in, in all that despair. He's happy. He's clapping, he's cheerful, he's excited. He, he's one, one, shaitan one, you zero, right? This is how he operates. Um, for other people, yeah, it could be, again, what, what has been decreed for you in terms of your uh, self. You know, body image is a very serious issue for a lot of women. A lot of women are crippled um, in terms of their life satisfaction because they're focusing and hyper-focusing on their physicality when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly tells us none of this matters. And, you know, none of this is important. It's important socially maybe to, for some people, but in the higher, greater scheme of things, if you're basing your value as a, as a person, as a, someone that is in existence on how you look, how your skin color is, your hair, your nose, your eye color, uh, and that's all you think of uh, when you think of yourself, it's a state of ingratitude, Billah. And that's what he wants, Shaitan wants you to do. He wants you to be so hyper focused on what you don't have or what you are not happy with what you have that you become completely um, 
in, 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 uh, you become completely oblivious to the good that he's given you, where you can't even see it. And this is also a disease of the heart, right? To be oblivious to God's blessings. So all of these, you see, these are all his attacks. Let me get you hyper-focused on, again, your physicality maybe, or maybe financially, you wish you, ha you had more financial you know, security. I wish I lived a different lifestyle. Maybe you're not happy with your relationship. So whatever you have, you know, that Allah has decreed for you, you're just not happy with it because you're comparing and contrasting it to, again, all these false, um, you know, fake uh, things that are happening around you or, you know, people's presentations around you. But what has he done? He's now chipped away at your trust in God and made you, put you in a state of ingratitude as well as despair. So it's not just to be sad about your situation. We're going to also um, help you to be blind to all of the other good around you and just sink you into a state of ingratitude. And that's what's happening everywhere. So many people are totally oblivious to God's blessings. And then that, uh, you know, if, if he's really working on you, and this is amazing, if he's really working on you, then he takes it to the next level, which is you're not only in denial of God's blessings, but now you're resentful. Now you're in a state of just total, uh, you know, it's all these cynical people around, they're just very negative people. Because, I, you know, once you're allowing gratitude to take over your heart, that's just what's going to happen. You're entitled. You are, you know, uh, arrogant because you think that you deserve better than what God decrees for you. So you're boastful, right? You're questioning God's decree. And this is what Shaitan did, right? He, he questioned Allah subhanahu wa decree. And he said, what? An khairu min. When, when Allah subhanahu wa told him to, to bow down, he was, why are you, you know, do, like he, he, he was challenged. Why did you create this creation? I'm better than him. So when we, you know, in any way object to the qadr of Allah and then we question that we deserve more or we're better, we're, we're also, can you see his psyches injected into ours? Like that's what he thinks, right? He thinks he's better. So we have to be careful of these thoughts. And that's why it's so important to pay attention to your thought pattern because when you can source the thoughts and you realize this is not me, I've just been hacked, you know, my mind has been hacked by these thoughts and I need to root them out and I need to start seeing them for what they are because his ultimate goal is to destroy me and make me feel, make me a, a, a sad, you know, a sh shell of a person that is only just, again, sinking. It's just sinking and that part of me that Allah subhanahu created that is supposed to rise and to, supposed to move forward is immobilized. And that's, that's who we're supposed to be as Muslims. We're supposed to be people of action right? We're, we're supposed to be people of purpose. Uh, we, we look to our, the Prophet I mean, he was from, you know, childhood, I mean, even before prophecy, but certainly after prophecy, uh, he never stopped. He never stopped teaching. He's not, he never stopped, you know, spreading the word. He never stopped even in his own practice. I mean, when you imagine the Prophet I who was promised Jannah waking up in the middle of the night and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point where his legs were swollen, where his wife Aisha was so overcome because she felt sad for him. And she's like, you know, basically, why, why are you doing this? Like, you know, you, you deserve a break too. Uh, and he told her, you know, why are you doing this? And he said to her, what am I, should I not be a grateful servant, you know, a slave? Um, but that was his uh, attitude, right? He never stopped. He allowed that to happen. You know, I mean, he pushed himself to that level. What are we doing, right? And so whenever you're immobilized and you're not busy and you're not keeping yourself busy, um, you're opening yourself up for shaitan to tell you what to do. So you're just going to sit around today, huh? Okay. Well, how about you turn on, you know, Netflix and let's watch something. Uh, you know what? Let's watch, um, you know, this show or nah, I'm not in the mood for that. Let's watch this show. And then you pick up, pick something that you know is probably going to have inappropriate things. Um, you know, there's really no benefit because likely, and how many of us now, we all have collective ADD, right? Even five minutes. I mean, there's very few people, I think, in the world that can sit through an entire film without being distracted by their device. I mean, I just, I don't know. You see movie theaters with signs that even warn people, please turn off your phones because that um, we're so tied to this thing that the impulse to check it every two seconds is really hard for people to resist. So it's like, what's the point? You're going to sit there, waste two to three hours of your time watching something that you're probably not going to remember very much. 
And then even within a few minutes of it, what are you going to do? You're going to check your phone message, maybe browse. I mean, I've caught, I mean, you know, it's, we all do it myself, but even I tease my husband. I'm like, you just made a big deal about watching this, whatever it is. And now you're browsing on Amazon. Like really, was there no other time? But we all do this because again, that's just the mind. We're, we're all hacked some way. Right. But that distractibility is also a part of it. So, you know, this is what he'll do. He'll fill the void um, with his own ideas. Right. And so it's like suggestions are going to be everything to distract you from Allah. And so you sit through that movie and guess what happens? You didn't even pay attention to the time to realize, oh my God, I forgot to pray Dhuhr or Asr. Oh, he won. He just took you away from the one of five things that you were literally designed to do. He made you not do it. And sometimes it's not even one prayer. You, you miss two, three prayers. Cause especially if you're going out, you see people. And I, I said this last night too, if you're at the point where you're, when you make a schedule or a plan with people and the thought about your prayers, how am I going to do them? What if I have, don't have will do doesn't enter your mind. That's a problem. That's a serious problem because your existence is to worship Allah. It's not to go out and have coffee or go to the mall and shop for five hours or go to the city and go to the beach and, you know, go have lunch with your friends or whatever people do. That's not your purpose. Your purpose is to pray. So before you finalize a plan with anybody, and even if you're spontaneous and you're like, oh, it's so fun, you know, those natures are, are normal. But before you do that, the, so the check is, wait a second, when does the come? When does Asr come? What if I don't have wudu? Where can I make wudu? Uh, you know, do I have a prayer mat in the car? Do I have, you know, this and that? You do that process and then you say, okay, I can meet you. But how many of us schedule our prayers or factor our prayers after we make plans or not even at all? You just bolt out the door and then, oops, I forgot to make wudu. It's okay. I'll just do khada. Astaghfirullah. Who did that? You know, and I'm not saying uh, taking away moral agency because we all have it. We're all responsible for our decisions, but the distractions uh, and the constant feed of ideas of what to do with your time. If you're not already thinking about it and planning and scheduling, then he will come and give you a whole host of ideas. But each of those ideas is to take you away from Allah. So this is why you have to know his tricks and pay attention and, and start to live, you know, a more purposeful scheduled life. Like the prayers are part of that, right? We, we, as I just said, we, we schedule our lives around our prayers, but also there's other ways to also be regimented and to keep yourself in check. Uh, someone asked, how do you condition your nafs? You got to know the diseases of the heart. So if you don't have this book, Purification of the Heart, um, you should definitely get this book. And if you've heard me ever speaking, I'm surprised if you don't know about this book because I talk about it all the time. I'm teaching classes right now for the youth. Tomorrow will be our last one on this book. But it's so important that we know this book and we work on rooting out the diseases. That's part of it. But it's also habituating your nafs, which is weak and which only wants to, you know, again, pull you away from Allah. Habituating you to do what? To have the remembrance of Allah, not just five times a day, but periodically throughout the day by adopting the practices of the Prophet I'm sticking to the Sunnah. We have to stick to the Sunnah. There is no way that we can possibly think that we're going to have a fast track or a faster way or whatever to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we bypass the Sunnah. It's just illogical and it's totally shaitanic to think that way. It's a, it's a waswas or that idea. So people who are who now come around with all these progressive ideas of you can skip this and oh I don't know about that sunnah and I'm not gonna do this like you're just delusional you are shaitans all over you because if you stray from the sunnah of the Prophet there's I don't I mean I, you know ultimately all outcomes are to Allah but um, you're not on a good you're not in a good place at all let's just say that so the sunnah we look we have to learn about the sunnah so you got to start somewhere if you don't even know his du'as when he woke up in the morning or how he kind of carried himself through the day, the things that he did, and you're not even thinking to adopt some of those things, or maybe you do here and there, that's where you start. You work on the disease of the heart in conjunction with adopting more of his sunnah. So for example, you know, when you get dressed, being uh, cognizant of 
your right hand, right? Everything on the right first. Um, you're just trying your best to, to adopt whatever he did. Say, Bismillah, we eat with our right hand. We enter the bathroom, we go with, our, you know, say the dua, and then we enter in our, with our left foot. We, we leave with our right foot. These are all practical things that we have learned by, you know, from his sirah. And uh, so we have to adopt those things, right? But we have to learn them. So you got to commit to reading about the sira, knowing about, um, you know, again, how he spoke, how he walked, how he engaged with people, his habit of, of smiling, for example. I mean, how many of us walk around with just stone faces and we're not, you know, we ignore people because we're socially just, we don't realize the, the, the immense amount of uh, focus on keeping good relations, and this all is from the Sunnah of the Prophet. Said, people become so inward and so insular again because of the internet and all the you know, we're just behind screens all day long that we don't, we're not even comfortable interacting with each other. But we can't even do the simplest thing, which is look at someone and smile. And subhanAllah, even though we know it's sadaqah, and you know, that the Prophet tells us don't diminish the value of small actions even the, the the smiling face in front of your brother is is a you know is is a is is a sadaqah is a charity right but we don't we don't uh look at those things as, as important so we just cut people off we wear our sunglasses we have our airpods in and we're just in our own world all by ourselves well stuff the law i mean if you're not going to Come, come out of your comfort zone and be willing to just give someone a smile, a friendly face, then you're far from the sunnah because that was the, the sunnah of the Prophet If there was anybody who was busier in the world, I mean, think about it. Think about his mission. Think about the weight on his shoulders. He, he said, if you knew what I knew, you would laugh little and weep much. He had so much heaviness. He carried, he had grief. He had lost every so many souls, dear souls, so many beloved people in his life. But he was still able to give a cheerful disposition. And yet we think that we don't need to do that because oh, I don't like people. I don't have time for people. You see all these really negative, annoying comments. Allah, may Allah forgive us because we're so far from his sunnah that we can even utter those things. People are, you know, part of Allah's creation. Muslim, not Muslim, it doesn't matter. But that's not the point. The point is, is if you are feeling the spiritual benefits of this deen, then it should ex just exude out of you. Like it's like a scent that just touches whoever you walk, uh, you know, in their path. Because the deen is so sweet to you and it's so beautiful to you that it just comes whether you like it or not. And that's what, why he was so effective is because he had that, that experience. He was completely immersed in it. He is, you know, the, and, and so everybody was impacted by that light, whoever came into his vicinity. They didn't, he didn't have to even speak, subhanAllah. And he would, people would be, you know, come into tears and tremble um, because they were so moved by his presence. But why? Because that was all from Allah. It was who he was. So when we think that, you know, our, we don't have any obligations to, to do those types of things because we just don't have time for people, you know, okay, so you're busier than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Okay. Anyway, so I, it's just a matter of training your nafs. Your nafs is weak. Shaitan wants to bring you down, and it's they work together. They're, they're allies to bring you down. The ruh, that part of you that longs for Allah, is like this poor little child desperate to go back to its source, you know? right? Allah is the source of, uh, we're all going to return to him. That ruh wants to be back with Allah, with its creator. And it's always longing for him. But we suppress it. We suppress it like we do a ch young child, shut it down. And we just, you know, increase this nafs and feed it and feed it and feed it and empower it. So that the voice of that ruh is like the voice of a faint, faint whisper of a child. Um, and then subhanAllah, out of Allah's generosity and wisdom, he forces us to uh, imprison that nafs during this month of Ramadan so that that child can speak up a little bit, that ruh can come up. And, and, and that's why, you know, you hear the book of Allah and all of a sudden your heart is moved. Why now and not a month ago? Why were you quick to turn it off because you wanted to play that song instead? How many people do that? You get in the car and it's an ayah of the Quran. They don't have the patience to let the ayah finish because they can't wait to play their song because that's the nafs and shaitan. Anything that has to do with Allah's remembrance, nah, it's not fun enough. It's not exciting enough. 
and then smile on this month why do we have the other experience where we hear we'll read an ayah and all of a sudden your heart is trembling because a child is finally able to speak so anyhow Are there any questions? I'm sorry, I kept you guys on here for a long time, but um, thank you for staying with me. Are there any questions about this? There's a lot of content on this um, about how to control our thoughts, but I think ultimately it comes down to recognizing the source of our thoughts and being able to, again, what I said earlier, credibility. Don't give Iblis credibility. He has zero credibility. He's nothing. He's useless. He's, as I said, the ultimate loser. So none of his whispering should hold any weight. Look to your Lord for to base your value. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the moms out there, if you're listening, we're This is why it breaks my heart because you think of Allah's generosity, right? He's told us, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. These two names of all the 99 names are probably after the name of Allah, the most um, repeated and the most recognizable, the ones that are probably evoked more so than any of the other attributes. Why? Because we learn these names in childhood before we even know Allah sometimes. We know Bismillah, Bismillah, Bismillah. Our parents are feeding us, our mothers. May Allah bless all of you mothers in your hands for feeding your children. But that word, Rahma, what an honor that our Lord gave us women. Because the womb that all of us possess, whether we're mothers or not, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be an actual mother. The womb is within you. And that immediately connects you to Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. What an honor from our Lord that he gave us that special, you know, station to know his intimate attributes in a way that men cannot know. They don't know Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim the way we do. And that's why, um, how many of us as mothers, um, I mean, I remember when my first son was born, subhanAllah, I, I marveled at the, obviously the miracle of the birth, but one of the things that really struck me was the ability, how in sync we were. He would, I would go sleep with him, but just a whimper from his voice and my heart would wake up whimper my eyes would open because I, the, the the thought that something could happen to him i know all of us experience that that comes from the rahma because we will forsake sleep you know for our for our children how many of us do that how many of us have done that for multiple children where you have no sleep no rest no peace because you're willing to give all of that up to take care of this infant this beautiful gift that Allah has given you but how many of us have seen and I saw I swear I saw it it was amazing to me because I said this is proof my husband you know he had to go to work and so so many times my the baby would be crying like crying and he would sleep right through it I'm like wow look at the difference I wake up on a whimper and you can sleep through a cry of an infant, that just was shocking to me. I never understood, but I know many women have had very similar experiences where their husbands are just like, I didn't even hear it. Oh, uh, was everything okay? And you're like, yeah, I had a really tough night last night. Thanks for helping out. And they have no clue, right? Because this is from Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. 
the incredible amount of mercy that we possess as women, as mothers, it just that nurturing quality that you're always tending to and caring for. And you see women who not only feed their children and take care of their families, their in-laws, their mothers, their neighbors, always thinking about someone else other than themselves. So that's why it's so hard to imagine the attack uh, is so effective on on this, on half of us, you know, we're half of our creation, of Allah's creation, such a large number of women are affected by this is because Iblis has gotten through. And where are the, you know, how can we fend him off if we don't band together and work, you know, I mean, and, and, and just push him out. And the only way we can do that again is if we band together, we have to work with each other and uplift each other, remind each other of how special we are. Women are incredible. You know, like oxytocin to me, I mean, there's so much to say about women's hormones and, and what have you. But I remember when I read the research, I just said, that's just Allahu Akbar. That when you come into a gathering of other women, even if no words are exchanged, your oxytocin levels, which bring in all of these really feel good, uh, anxiety suppressing, ca their calming, you know, mood uh, hormones, it, it increases just because you're with other women. Inshallah, good women, right? Allahu Akbar. So women, we have incredible power, but we, again, you know, we've been hacked into, so we don't believe in any of these things. We've, we're listening to, you know, all the, 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 the waswasa from Iblis, but from where, from, you know, beauty influencers and stylists and men who are, you know, I mean, that just always gets me too, that so many of the standards of beauty that are throughout the world are come from men and they're not even heterosexual men. How many people who are in the beauty industry, whether it's makeup, whether it's clothing, whatever it is, if you look at women's fashion, women's beauty, how many men are in that, you know, industry that are not even heterosexual? And yet, they get to dictate to us what is worthy and what's not, what's beautiful and what's not. It's unbelievable the amount of, like, you know, just to think about how um, uh, his, his tricks are so effective. Because if you think about it on a logical level, it's like, wow, that's pretty pathetic and sad. Yet we're, we're still affected by it because he's managed to again cripple us in so many ways and to break away our confidence and then you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know look at our prophet so first thing he did one of the first things he did was he renewed the value of the life of a, of, of a, a female infant and then full circle his last sermon sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he warned he warned everybody he warned the men about the treatment of women he elevated us constantly throughout his entire mission. Women were elevated. He would ask for our advice. He would, you know, take counsel, but he would speak to women. There's that beautiful story that we just heard recently of the woman who interrupted him when he was talking to his companions. And in the, it's in the Shamayl and in the Tafsir, she was actually not just a, an ordinary woman. She had mental health issues. So she, she was known to be unwell and unstable. But he you have to read this hadith, how he honored her. It hit my heart like a... Because he's honoring women and he's also honoring people who are, you know, considered the throwaways, as Sheikh Hisham Mahmoud said. They, we consider people who are not well the throwaways of society. And so that hadith is so powerful because you see him inviting her. He says to her, pick, she says, I, have, I want to talk to you. And he says to her, pick any street in Medina and I'll come and I'll sit with you. Who does that? This is our promise while I said him. So he knew our worth, but we don't give him and his words enough credibility to, to, you know, internalize those messages. We look to fashion person so-and-so or celebrity so-and-so. And then we, you know, it's just, everything's flip-flopped. Everything's inverted. And that's, you know, 
signs of the end of time. Nothing makes sense. But that's why, you know, this is what we have to do. We have to take this stuff seriously. When we're told to think about ourselves, you know, Allah subhanahu wa commands us over 750 times in the Quran. He tells us to think, ponder, deliberate. So all those thoughts that we were talking about, 80,000 thoughts, well, yeah, if you're not controlling them and you're not actively, you know, trying to, you know, take control of the narrative of what those thoughts are telling you, then you're going to be affected by all of this just toxicity and negativity and lies. It's a campaign of lies, but we're all eating it up. The truth, the haq is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet So that's all we need to to you know dial this noise down it's just it's it's noise and it's harmful and it, it's meaningless and it's empty and dial this up and you know th th then you'll see your your heart is just in a better state because you realize that why am i letting this stuff in turn off your televisions I, you know and i am I, I have netflix you know i'm, I'm not on here on a soapbox against all of you know technology and whatever but if you what i mean to say about turn off your televisions is be more aware of what you're consuming. If you're going to consume garbage, um, then don't be, you know, don't complain about the stench because you consumed it. So make sure whatever you let into your mind's eye that you watch and hear, um, that you realize it's going to impact your heart, all, everything. Because those 80,000 thoughts uh, a day are coming from sources and certainly the media is also a, a huge source, right? The media and other people. So whether it's social media or print media, or whatever media it is, you know, be careful. Don't let everything in. Guard your heart. It's the most precious thing you possess. Nothing is more important than the spiritual heart. Nothing. And if you don't, you know, protect it with everything you have, then, you know, the, what happens, the hacking system is so easy. It's like, you know, a computer with uh, all the security features is a lot harder to get into, right? Than a computer with nothing on it, no software, no password, nothing. That's what we've become. We have no, where there's no safeguarding the heart. And then we wonder why we're in this horrible state that we're in what are we doing we have to actively be doing things to safeguard the heart so it really is in our hands and that's why alhamdulillah our deen is a deen that empowers people it's not a deen of victimization and woe is you and poor you and oh so sorry that this happened to you no matter what happens we're told get up and move get up, be in a state of gratitude. This world is temporary. It's part and parcel of this world that you're going to have tribulation, but pick it up because it's not the end. The, this, there's a final you know, end to this world. And the next one is, is where you want to have your eyes set on. So you know, dust yourself off, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, but move forward. And that's, uh, that's the message of our deen, alhamdulillah. So we have to just, again, go back to the basics learn about who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is learn about the sunnah of his of this world learn our aqidah look to the sunnah of the prophet him, adopt his way over ourselves prefer his way you do that and you you'll see the difference in your mental health your relationships everything just starts to fall into place because you're actually taking the medicine or the elixir that's going to offset the poison that you've been feeding on your whole life. You're finally going to get the remedy. That's it. But if you don't get the remedy, then you can't expect healing. So may Allah increase all of you and protect you. Um, thank you for being here. My goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is one of those days where the heart is full and it's brimming. And so thank you for being with me in this moment. Uh, um, and I hope you find benefit in this. Uh, my initial intention was to just sort of speak on these matters, but I'm really happy that so many of you joined so that we could benefit Brother Munir and his family, inshallah, with hopefully our, all of our collective recitation of Surat Yassin. So please keep him and his family in your du'as. Um, if there are any other questions, let me know now because, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and end it if there's no questions. I don't see... I just see the chat open, but there's not even a question box. Okay. So yeah, if there's no questions, then we can go ahead and end in dua, inshallah. But thank you for your time. All right. Oh, wait, there are some questions. Hello. I'm sorry. I have a question. There's so many hadith about having a daughter and how it's guaranteed. Okay.
So someone's asking about having daughters versus sons. You know, don't let those things um, affect you. When you raise children, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. So subhanAllah, I hope you're still here, sister. Are you still here? Because I want you to hear this. Galaxy Note 9. I hope you're still here. But I'm going to share something with you that will give you some peace, hopefully. This hadith, um, where did it go? Sorry, just give me a minute so I can find it. So the Prophet said, okay, so this is um, uh, related by a Sahabi named Uthman ibn Madhun, okay? And he says, <clears throat> he was passing by the Prophet one day and he was carrying a baby on his shoulder. And, uh, it was the, and the Prophet asked if the baby was his son, okay? So he said, yes. And then uh, the Prophet asked him, do you love your son? And he said, of course, yes, very much so. And then the Prophet said, should I tell you something that would increase your love for your son even more? And uh, Uthman said, yes, please, may my mother and father be ransomed for you. And then the Prophet said, remember, this is for him and his son. He said, whoever tries to please a child until the child is pleased with him or her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bestow upon them his generosity. So I'm a mother of two boys. And this, you know, hadith is hopefully brings some comfort to your heart that not all of, you know, um, the the things that we've been told about children are centered necessarily around, you know, or the benefits and the rewards are only for daughters. It's really about raising your children on deen and giving them, inshallah, um, you know, hidayah. That's what you want to look at. And honestly, you know, I've heard it too. I know a lot of people, my own family members have pushed me over the years. You should have more, you should have a daughter, you should have a daughter. But I always say, alhamdulillah, I am grateful for whatever Allah decrees for me because he knows what's better for me and he knows what's better for that child that's going to come into this world. I may think that I want a girl or, you know, some people think that I don't, I'm not saying that for myself, but someone might think that, but only Allah knows what's truly best. And that's why, you know, the story of Khidr uh, and Musa is important because we don't really know the outcomes of anything, but when Allah decrees something, you have to be content with it and just put your trust that he knows better and not to hold on to a message uh, that is intended really more to honor uh, us, you know, uh, w girls because it, the society around them at that time, remember, female infanticide was something that was in practice. So the Prophet is trying to you know, educate people that, that that's totally haram and unacceptable, but not only that, incentivize and give people glad tidings that when you have a daughter or you know, two or three, that this is the reward for you. So. I think there was a lot of intention in why that was revealed, but not to take that to mean that subhanAllah, if you don't have a girl, it was somehow you're missing out. The gift of motherhood is a gift, whether it's a boy or a girl or not, it doesn't matter. It's a child, it's a soul, it's a believer, it's a servant, inshallah, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will continue your lineage um, of believers until the day of judgment. That's what you want to focus on, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. How can we condition our nafs? So I, I, I did address that, um, Ambreen. I talked about, you know, follow or studying the diseases of the heart and then also habituating yourself to follow the sunnah as much as possible. You have to follow the sunnah. If you abandon the sunnah or you don't follow the sunnah as much, then your nafs is kind of floating around trying to figure things out for itself. And it's always going to lean to the lazy thing. But if you know that the process and did something, adopt it as best as possible, you know, as much as you can incorporate that into your life, even if it's not something comfortable for you, you know, it, you, that's what it is. It's disciplining enough to get used to a new normal, a better normal. No problem. Alhamdulillah. Um, we, should, we, should, should, we should take action with the issue at hand or dismiss, take an effective action to help us at hand or just remain in a neutral until you're able to move forward. I'm sorry, um, Sister Anne, I'm not clear on when you asked that question, what it was related to. So I, if you're still here, if you want to clarify, I can answer that question, but I'm not, yeah, I don't know what I was saying when you asked that question. So I'll wait if Anne, you want to answer. I'm just going to quickly, sorry, I'm getting a lot of messages. I hope there's nothing wrong with the recording.
recording. Okay. Okay, alhamdulillah. Could you give some tips on how to overcome procrastination? That's a very good one. Procrastination is one of the telltale signs too of spiritual, um, because tul al-amal is false hopes, right? Um, and I, I don't want to get the hadith wrong, but there's a hadith that, it, again, in summary, the message is, we're not, you know, the one who wakes up in the morning isn't promised the evening and the one who's in you know evening or, or is alive in the evening isn't promised the morning and so we have to remember nothing is guaranteed for you and false hopes or this idea that you have all the time in the world to get something done or you think a week or two weeks i'll just do it do it do it then later this is all false hopes and it's you know um it's basically inspired by shaitan because he wants to deprive you of getting those rewards and he knows that your your natural sort of nafsi nature might kick in and prevent you later from doing it right like right now you might have that energy for it and the drive but give it you know a week and maybe you're just going to change your mind and go no what was i thinking let's say like for example you want to go take a class you know you see a class being advertised and it's on quran you know tafsir and you're like, oh my God, I should totally sign up for this, right? It sounds so great. And so then, um, then he'll come and say, you know, why don't you do it later when all, you know, the kids are asleep and everything's totally, you know, calm down. Now, all those hours in between, you might forget, first of all, okay? You might not even do it later because it's just not in your mind. Um, but let's say you do do, it comes to you again. Maybe you had an event that day that just discouraged you and you don't feel good about yourself. You had a fight with your husband or your mom or something went wrong at work. Now, if, if that, you know, tab was still open on your computer and you see it, you're just going to go and exit out. You're going to go forget it. What was I thinking? I don't have the time and energy to take on this. I can't even, you know, sustain my household. Do you see how Shaitan works? Had you signed up and committed in the moment, even because you were, that was an inspiration and you felt it then that commitment would have maybe taken you out of the state that you found yourself in later because now it's like well khair, at least i have this class i can look forward to and maybe it'll wake me up and you have a little bit more pep you know because you have something to look forward to but he didn't allow for that because he convinced you that you could just put it off until later so if you have the inclination to do good um do good and i'll, I'll actually give you a quick story was it yesterday? And I just said, subhanAllah. So I've been intending, I have family members in Iran and I've been intending to send a little bit uh, from, from Sadaqa to them. Um, but the person that I go, through, I forgot. It was just a memory thing. So then I read a hadith and I, I wish I had it, but I don't know where it is right now. Uh oh, my internet's unstable. So I think I froze, but I read this hadith. Um, and in the hadith, it said something about if, you know, shaitan, one of his tactics is he will divert your focus so that if you want to do something good, especially with charity, with charitable giving, um, he'll tell you to do it later. So then when I read that hadith, I was like, oh my God, I never did that. And I rushed to my phone. I got onto PayPal and I was going to do it right then and there. And subhanAllah, PayPal was um, completely not working. I don't know what happened. Every time I signed in, it wouldn't take my password and it, or it took my password, but then it redirected me. And I was like, oh my God. And then I came on the browser and I tried, it wasn't working. It locked me out because I tried so many attempts with the password, even though it's weird because I have face ID anyway, but I was like, wow. And then I, I couldn't do it because I had to prepare for a live. And so I haven't done it yet. <laughs> Inshallah, I'll try to get today, but this is how, you know, what happens when we procrastinate is that he'll find other ways possibly to thwart our good. So, but inshallah, we keep our intentions good. So try to just, when you have that inspiration to do something, do it then and there, be a person of action, inshallah. Okay. All right, sisters, we've been talking for two hours and I certainly did not intend that, but I am very uh, grateful to all of you for spending so much time with me. So jazakallah khairan. May Allah again increase you, all of you, uh, reward you. May he accept all of your fasts, your prayers, your duas, all of your good deeds this month, inshallah. 
and uh, your family. May he protect you and your family from all harm, inshallah. And hopefully we'll come out of this whole situation wiser and more connected, inshallah, to him and to our loved ones. So jazakumullah khair. And please, again, remember Brother Munir and his family in your du'as. So we'll end in du'a, inshallah. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika shalom la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa la asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr alhamdulillah jazakallah khairan thank you have a good day ladies and enjoy your iftar assalamu alaykum